this recording on. All right. Hi, everybody. Hopefully, everyone had a good weekend, as good as possible with these crazy times we're in. Um, we're actually at the just past the halfway point in the semester. So we're speeding along here. Um, we just passed the three week mark. So we've got another three weeks to go. And um, we're gonna work on the respiratory today. Let me go back to the other screen just to sort of go over what we're going to cover. Um, so today we'll be going over the second respiratory lecture. The first one, of course, I sent you the, the link for that, the video link. Uh, today we'll go over the respiratory lecture number two. Um, tomorrow we'll review for the exam. Um, you should have a copy of the study guide, which is posted on Blackboard. And of course the exam is just gonna be on the four lectures, the two cardio and the two respiratory lectures. Um, a little bit of it, more information about the exam. It's gonna essentially be the same format as we saw with the first exam. 50 multiple choice questions, two points each, which is going to bring it up to 100 points. Um, so that's gonna be a total of 100 points. Um, you're going to have, as usual, 90 minutes to complete the exam unless you've got special arrangements, special accommodations through me. Um, and as far as the exam window, um, I will inform you about that, what it's going to be tomorrow. Does anyone out there, I know you guys are mostly muted, um, does anyone remember what the exam window was last time? Was it from 10 to 2? Can anyone sort of, does anyone, anyone remember what it was? I mean, I could always go back and look. Uh, hello, it was from one to five. Oh, one to five, Never mind. Okay, so yeah, so I'm gonna plan to keep it around the same time, um, one to five, let me write that down. And within that time, you'll have 90 minutes. So same format as before, it seemed like everything went smooth didn't have any glitches, which is always a challenge with these sorts of exams. So, all right. Okay, um, so before we get started on the second respiratory, anybody have any questions? Someone, let's see. Oh, one to five, thank you. Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so you remember with last lecture, our first respiratory lecture, we went through kind of the basics of respiration um, involving, of course, gas exchange, moving of oxygen from some medium, whether it's water or air, to the tissues, moving carbon dioxide from the tissues the opposite direction, through the medium and eventually either out through the water, out through the air. Um, we spoke about different types of animals and their respiratory systems, whether we're looking at the very efficient fish gills um, to the um, dual respiratory organs, such as we saw in the frog, or actually three respiratory organs in the amphibians, right, with, with the gills, skin, and lungs as an adult. We learned about how they work. Then we jumped into land, looking at land animals where they've evolved these um, internal organs as opposed to the external organs, right? And of course, the importance with that is that with internal organs, you're no longer vulnerable to dehydration. The organs don't dehydrate. So that's where we saw the evolution of lungs and other organs. We spoke about the um, insects where they have the tracheoles, very efficient at delivering oxygen directly to the tissues without the aid of a circulatory system. As our systems became much more complex and much more um, evolved, of course, uh, we needed, obviously we depended upon the circulatory system. 
so we spoke about the frog, we spoke about the bird lungs, right? Um, and then we briefly spoke about mammalian lungs. Um, when we're talking about breathing, of course, we spoke about a couple other things, why these different organs are so efficient. Remember, we spoke about with the gills, the role of a countercurrent exchange with the blood extracting oxygen uh, from the water, where water always is a slightly higher amount, so there's a constant diffusion. Um, to things like in the bird lung, where you've got a cross current, where it's not a counter current in opposite directions, it's more perpendicular, but it still accomplishes basically the same thing, um, extracting um, oxygen out of the air that always has a slightly higher concentration. Um, so you should know some of the key features of each organ. Remember with the bird lung, there's two complete cycles of inhaling and exhaling required for a bolus of air to be moved. So twice the opportunity to extract oxygen and other features. All right, so today really the focus is going to be on um, really gas exchange. Um, and taking a look at what happens at some of the tissues with the exchange of oxygen and CO2. All right, so before we get to, to that, I wanted to expand a little bit on the mammalian lung. You know, we've spoken about the site for gas exchange in fish, remember, which are the secondary lamellae on the gills, where you have the counter current exchange. We spoke about the site for gas exchange in um, bird lungs, which are the parabronchi. And then of course, the site for gas exchange in the mammalian lungs. And yeah, primarily the mammalian lungs would be the alveoli. These, the, these are these little grapes um, that are part of these clusters where gas exchange occurs. And they look very different from parabronchi as well as gills, but one common feature of any organ where you have gas exchange, and that is you need to have an area with a very high surface area. The gills have a high surface area. The parabronchi, very high surface area. The alveoli, due to all the, the folding, um, close proximity to blood vessels because if you're going to exchange gases, you want it close to, to be able to move that oxygen into the blood and the CO2 from the blood back into the um, lungs. And thirdly, the thinness of the respiratory membrane. The respiratory membrane is really kind of like the, ba the barrier, or the boundary between the medium and the blood. And you want that, that tissue to be very thin to allow for very rapid diffusion. And the same is true here. So these are the, really the main properties of any sort of gas exchange, proximity to capillaries, very large surface area, thin epithelium, those are the cells that make up the respiratory membrane, which results in a short diffusion distance. So this is why people who have lung conditions where they get scarring of the lungs, like people who have emphysema, one of the things that makes it so difficult to breathe is that the tissue is now scarred. So we don't no longer just have simple squamous epithelium. We have thicker tissue, which makes it more difficult for oxygen to move across. All right. So getting into gas exchange, as I had mentioned early on, the key feature of any gas exchange is transport. And when we're looking at gas transport or movement from one area to the other, the type of transport we rely on is simple diffusion. You may have heard from other classes things like active transport, facilitated diffusion, right, things like that. We're relying here on simple diffusion, which of course involves movement of, from an area of high concentration or high pressure to an area of low pressure when we're talking about gases. These numbers refer to the pressure of that gas, which is really correlated with the amount of it. So let's take a look at an example of diffusion. Let's first take a look at oxygen. Oxygen moves from the lungs, the alveoli, where it's at a pressure of 100. 
it moves into the circulation, remember the pulmonary circuit, where the pressure is 40. Remember, we're looking at the pulmonary arteries, bringing oxygen poor blood back. So 100 to 40, that's high to low, that's diffusion. Now we're in the pulmonary veins where the blood concentration or the oxygen concentration is back up to 100, thanks to this diffusion. That blood now enters into the circuit, goes back to the heart where it's pumped out into the systemic circuit, and that oxygen is dumped off at tissues where the concentration of oxygen is about 40. Why is it so low? Because metabolism is taking place here. Remember, metabolism is where nutrients plus oxygen get burned, expression so-called burned or metabolized into CO2 and water. So we're using up oxygen, which provides a nice kind of a slide for oxygen to come right into these active tissues. Right? Oxygen is dumped off, and the oxygen that goes back to the lungs is now very low. Let's take a look at CO2. Now CO2, it's also diffusion, but we're looking at opposite directions. Here we're looking at CO2 going from the tissues to the blood out through the lungs. CO2 in the, in the tissues is around 46. Some books will say 45 or 47. But because it's building up, right, we're using up oxygen, generating CO2. That CO2 easily enters into the blood where the amount of CO2 in at least the arterial blood is at 40. 46 to 40. Not a big difference, but you don't need much. It's going to go down its gradient. Now we've got 46 back in the venous. Think of this as the vena cava. Goes back to the right atria, right through the right ventricle. And then it reaches the lungs, and the lungs have a CO2 level of 40, from 46 to 40. So every step of the way, with both oxygen and CO2, we're looking at movement of this, uh, ga these gases from a high concentration to low concentration. What's really quite fascinating, and I'm not going to go into detail, but there are some great studies that were done back in like 1910 by August Crow. He was a well-known Danish animal physiologist, and um, a lot of people were trying to study how does oxygen go from the lungs to the blood. No one could figure it out. They thought he was pumped out. They didn't know. Well, he was really the first person to figure out that it's through diffusion. And I'm not going to ask you to know his name or anything like that, but a very well-known animal physiologist, August Crow. All right. So now we're going to take a look at a very important protein. Um, that has a, has a crucial role in transport of, of respiratory gases, primarily oxygen, and that is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, of course, is a protein that's found within red blood cells. Um, it's what gives it the blood its red color. Um, it's also the protein that binds, binds to oxygen, to a lesser extent CO2. When it binds to oxygen, this triggers a conformational change, which gives the blood the red color, um, which explains why arterial blood is brighter, kind of a brighter red than venous blood. In reality, it's not that dramatic red and blue, but just for visual purposes, um, we've kind of given it that perception. All right. So what do we know about hemoglobin? Well, it's a protein. Um, it's a protein that's made up of four subunits of polypeptides. These, there's two of these blue structures and two of these purple ones, right? Each of these structures are globin molecules. Globin is a, basically a polypeptide. These two blue globins are what we call the beta chain. These two purple ones, or violet ones, are known as the alpha chain. And that has to do with conformational differences, differences in covalent bonding. So you've got these four globins. They covalently bind to one another. And now you have hemoglobin. Well, how do we get the name heme in hemoglobin? Heme, um, 
heme comes from the actual molecule heme that's bound to each globin polypeptide. Each so there's four here, right? Two blue, two purple. Each of these globin polypeptides has one heme molecule that you see in red. Each heme molecule has the ability to bind one oxygen molecule. So if each of these have the ability to bind one oxygen molecule, one entire hemoglobin can bind to four. Now, it normally doesn't because as much as oxygen does bind to hemoglobin, there's some oxygen that's delivered to tissue. So there's never, you never have 100% binding. And of course, heme is an iron-containing compound. This is one reason why it's important to get your minimum daily allowances of iron, because they help to assemble the heme. Right, let me just go back for a second. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about properties of hemoglobin and really focus right now on its ability to transport oxygen. Um, we'll talk about CO2 later. So hemoglobin is an iron containing protein found in red blood cells that transports respiratory gases, primarily oxygen. A couple terms that are commonly used in physiology referring to the interaction of hemoglobin and oxygen is loading and unloading. The term loading refers to the binding of oxygen with hemoglobin that occurs right around the lungs, right? Remember, we breathe in oxygen. That oxygen passes through the respiratory membrane, goes into the blood where it binds to hemoglobin. This is what we call loading. Think of it as like getting on the bus. Well, then what happens is that's great. We've got the oxygen on the hemoglobin, but we don't want it to stay on the hemoglobin, right? The purpose of the hemoglobin is to move the oxygen to the tissues where it can be delivered to sustain those tissues. When oxygen, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Life gets in the way sometimes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, um, so unloading is where the oxygen is released from the hemoglobin when you get to tissues, specifically metabolically active tissues that require a lot of oxygen. So loading, oxygen goes on, you're getting on the bus. Unloading, you're getting off the bus, oxygen is being delivered to the tissues. Now you sort of wonder, it's like, well, how can the same molecule, oxygen, bind to hemoglobin, and then be released from it. Well, it has to do with changing affinity or changing um, um, strength of binding between them, the two. And this varies depending on where you are in the body, right? We're going to talk about a few of these. Three factors that I want to focus on, and two in, mostly in particular right now, are pH and temperature. When we're talking about, you would think, okay, the body is 37 degrees Celsius, right? And the pH is around 7.2 to 7.4, right? That's throughout the body. However, there are specific regions of the body that may be very active. Say if you're working out, your muscles are working. Well, when you work out, the temperature at your muscles goes up, right? And with metabolism, right, you're, um, what's going to happen is you're going to generate lactic acid, basically. It's carbon dioxide or, or carbonic acid, part of the metabolic pathway. When you generate more acid, the pH drops. Okay, So two factors help to uncouple hemoglobin from oxygen, and that is increased temperature, low pH. Both of those are characteristics of uh, rapidly metabolizing tissues. So that helps to kind of release the oxygen. The other one is altitude, which is something we'll talk a little bit about l later, with especially with high altitude animals such as llamas, how they're able to adapt to um, conditions where there's very little oxygen. All right. 
Okay, so I mentioned that hemoglobin transports oxygen. And just to let you know specifically, if you think of what different things can move oxygen through the blood, hemoglobin basically is responsible pretty much for 98% of all the, the um, oxygen that's moved through the blood is moved by way of hemoglobin. Maybe a small amount just passes through the plasma. Right. So in other words, without the hemoglobin, we would not be able to, be, to sustain ourselves like we are now. We wouldn't be able to get oxygen to the tissues without hemoglobin. And if any of you guys have ever had anemia, or know of anyone who's had anemia who have very low, low hemoglobin, you notice how tired you get, right? And that's due to the fact you're unable to deliver the amount of oxygen that you would like to. Um, as far as a numbers comparison, if we look at whole blood, for example, if you think of, well, per 100 mils of whole blood, when I mean whole blood, we're talking about cells as well as plasma. We can move about 20 mils of oxygen. We can carry that much oxygen in the blood, in whole blood. If we remove the red blood cells, we can only move about 0.3 mils. So going from 0.3 to 20, it's a huge difference. This is what we call a difference in oxygen carrying capacity. Right? With all these hemoglobins being able to bind potentially up to four oxygens, hemoglobin greatly increases the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. And you'll, we'll talk a little bit more about carrying capacity later. All right. Now, one interesting unexpected situation is that oxygen is not the only thing that binds to hemoglobin. Um, another thing that can bind to hemoglobin is carbon monoxide, right? Carbon monoxide, when carbon monoxide is bound to hemoglobin, it's what we call carboxyhemoglobin. And you've all heard of carbon monoxide, right? We usually hear about it in a negative way, right? Where someone is suffocates due to maybe uh, ingesting fumes, whether intentional or unintentional. Um, from their gas pipe, um, elderly people that live back east, say in the winter time with the heater, right? The heat, heater involves, um, generates a lot of carbon monoxide. And what can happen, elderly people who can't get out, they can suffocate from that. So what is the significance of carbon monoxide? The fact is carbon monoxide binds with hemoglobin with a bond that's 250 times greater than the bond between hemoglobin and oxygen. So yes, hemoglobin and oxygen have a high affinity, but if you throw carbon monoxide into the realm, right, that's going to displace oxygen. And that's why carbon monoxide is so dangerous. So carbo carboxy hemoglobin is another name for that interaction between carbon monoxide and hemoglobin. All right. Um, as I mentioned, hemoglobin is the protein that's responsible for carrying oxygen through the blood, about 98% of it. Um, and as I mentioned before, if hemoglobin lo levels get low, you don't have the oxygen carrying capacity. When hemoglobin levels are low, this is known as anemia. Now, one of the things that protects us from and from things like this from anemia, is the fact that we naturally produce a hormone called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is a hormone that's produced by the kidneys, and it typically responds if the oxygen levels in the blood are low. If oxygen levels in the blood are low, stimulates the kidney to make erythropoietin. Erythropoietin travels to the bone marrow, stimulates the production of red blood cells, right? Red blood cells, of course, have hemoglobin, and now we're able to carry more oxygen. You may have heard of erythropoietin too. It's, it, in other ways, um, it's clinically used to treat people with anemia. You can, even though it's produced naturally, doctors can actually treat someone with it, get extra. Um, also, unfortunately, it's become a, a drug that's used in some 
elite athletes to greatly increase the production of red blood cells, which in theory you would say <clears throat> that's going to increase the amount of hemoglobin, which is going to allow the athlete to carry more oxygen, which is going to increase their endurance. Nor, nat, one, one thing you can do naturally to do that would be to, to train at a high altitude, right? High altitude naturally increases erythropoietin. But one of the dangers of someone injecting erythropoietin for athletic performance, besides the fact that it's illegal, is the fact that your blood cell concentration can get so great that the blood becomes very viscous and sluggish. And when it gets sluggish, that's going to interfere with the ability to deliver blood to tissues. And this has actually caused heart attacks in some people. So, uh, oh, this is the same slide that I showed you before. So I'm just kind of revisiting the difference between loading and unloading. All right. I want to introduce you to a, a physiological uh, measurement or a physiological chart that's called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And this is a curve that contains two parameters typically, right? We've got on the x-axis, we've got, we're looking at concentrations of oxygen. On the y-axis, we're looking at the percent of oxyhemoglobin. In other words, how much of the hemoglobin in the blood is binding oxygen. If all the hemoglobin in the, in the blood is all four sites on every hemoglobin are full of oxygen, we would have 100% saturation. The reality is we don't. Um, you should normally have in the, in the 90s, um, and you can actually look at your oxygen saturation. You go to the hospital or the doctor, they can put like a little clamp on your finger, and they can actually measure. Um, so it's normally in the high 90s, maybe 98, okay? Um, as, of course, we get closer, we, so think of this, this is at the arteries. Just think of this as at the systemic arteries that are leaving the heart. Saturation is about 98%, right? As we get close to here, this is where we're dropping it off at the capillaries, right? the saturation decreases to roughly about 75%. This is a theoretical, this part right here is theoretical. We typically don't actually see this, but you can kind of see the sigmoid curve. So if this is the saturation at, this is the percent saturation in the arteries, this is the percent saturation in the veins, and you look at the actual corresponding oxygen levels, 100 at in the arteries, 40, say, in the veins. And you can kind of go back looking at this, right? Remember, there's 40 right there versus 100. We've delivered 60 millimeters of mercury or oxygen at 60 millimeters of mercury to the tissues. So this is kind of a neat chart where you can really do a neat little correlation between levels of oxygen and saturation. All right, this is just the same diagram. I just found one I thought was pretty cool, a nice big one. <clears throat> um, again, this is, the, the labeling of the axes are different, but it's really the same. This is the pressure of oxygen. And what they're calling the percent of heme groups that are oxygenated, this is the same thing as really hemoglobin saturation. And you can see we get this nice sigmoid curve. This would be up in the arteries, right? And this would be, down by the veins. And we can see there's a gradual, the affinity, notice we're losing oxygen. And of course, why is that? Well, remember I mentioned that as you get closer to the tissues, the pH decreases, the um, temperature increases, which uncoup helps to uncouple the hemoglobin from the oxygen. All right. Now I wanna take a look at a variety of different conditions that affect humans, and of course, this is an animal physiology class, affect animals as well. Um, and this is in conditions where we have, looking at the oxygen binding and very, very active tissues. So if whether the, your muscles are resting or the muscles are active, we find that oxygen delivery 
changes. Here we've got two different graphs. This blue one is just a normal one. This would be something like you would see right here. Okay. If we're looking at a metabolically active tissue, like you're exercising a lot, right? Or maybe even you're eating a meal, right? You're getting a lot of blood delivery to your digestive system, right? Very active tissues. We get what we call a right shift. When you see a right shift in, the, in this graph, right from the blue one to the red one, this correlates with a decrease in hemoglobin oxygen affinity. Decrease in affinity means the binding is, is not as strong, which means now the oxygen is more freely able to go to the tissues. It's basically escaping from the hemoglobin. Okay. Um, now these terms right here, this shows, for example, the amount of oxygen that you need to get 50% saturation in a um, normal oxyhemoglobin curve. This is showing the amount of oxygen you need to get 50% saturation when you've got reduced affinity. And you can see there's a tremendous right shift. So always think of right shift, it's a decrease in affinity. All right. And again, this is true in all animals. Some animals, it's more stronger than others. Well, the name for this right shift is what we call the Bohr effect, which was named for a well-known physiologist, also a Danish one, named Christian Bohr. Uh, you guys have taken chemistry or physics. You may have heard of Niels Bohr. Um, Christian was, was Niels' father. So how about that for a family where you got both of them earned Nobel Prizes? Um, so what is the Bohr effect? Well, the Bohr effect is really what I just described. It's a decrease in the hemoglobin oxygen affinity due to a decrease in pH and an increase in temperature. Now, I threw in there carbon dioxide. Okay, so why is that? Well, let me show you. Let me just go ahead and... Okay, well, if we look at the equation, CO2, oops, 2, plus H, ah, I'm a finger typer here, 2O, right? That's going to lead to H2CO3, which is also known as carbonic acid. Well, you know with any acid, you know from your other classes, that one characteristic of an acid is that an acid donates hydrogen. All right, so that dissociates into plus, I'm um, plus, HCO3 minus. I'm not going to get into all the chemistry. My main, my main focus here is this right here. Hydrogen, right? So increased CO2 is going to drive the reaction to the right. You're going to generate carbonic acid, dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen. Okay. All right. So... Decreased pH, increased CO2 kind of run hand in hand, okay? That's gonna cause a right shift in the equation. In this case, this red dashed line. So this is the Bohr effect, increased CO2, decreased pH, increased temperature. I threw in something else we'll talk about shortly, and that has to do with a metabolic byproduct called DPG. Don't worry about it right now, but increased levels of DPG also cause a right shift, but different scenario. Let's just focus on pH, CO2, and temperature. pH decreases, increase temperature, increase CO2. That's the Bohr effect, right shift. Occurs in metabolically active tissues. In contrast, 
notice this green line, right? This left shift is associated with an increase in hemoglobin oxygen affinity. This typically occurs around the lungs, and we'll talk about this a bit more. This is known as the Haldane effect. High levels of oxygen displace the CO2, so hemoglobin and oxygen bind more tightly. All right, so Haldane effect to the left, Bohr effect to the right. And we'll talk about these more in just a bit. All right. So this is kind of repetitive, but this is really showing, you know, reduced affinity to the right, um, reduction. It's so what is the affinity? It's the change in the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. All right. So again, speaking about animals, it could be any animal, but this was an experiment that happened to be done in dogs. And what they did, they did a study looking at the hemoglobin oxygen affinity, where they just varied the amount of CO2 in the animal, right? And you notice what happened, if this is in the normal curve, as they increased the amount of CO2, there is a further and further shift to the right. So the greater the change in pH, the greater the shift, right? The greater the increase in CO2, the greater the shift. Um, and so on. This happens to be CO2. Um, if we take a look at pH, the same thing, right? Um, here we've got normal physiological pH 7.4. The Bohr effect would be this right shift if the pH is a little bit lower. This would be more of a Haldane effect to the left. I like how they put like a, a clinical person in there, pretty cool. All right, so I mentioned there's one other parameter that can influence hemoglobin oxygen affinity, and that's DPG. So how does that fit in? Well, the condition known as hypoxia, which obviously can occur in people who have impaired lung function, but say even if you have a normal lung function, but you climb high altitude, so you climb up to Mount Whitney, 14,000 feet, or if you're ambitious, climb to Mount McKinley, 20,000 feet. Um, I've been up to Mount Whitney, hard to breathe up there. Um, so you're in a hypoxic state. So obviously, if you're going to survive, you've got to somehow adapt. And so what's happening at that high altitude, you've got less hemoglobin that's binding to oxygen because there's less oxygen. Um, we somehow, we, even though we're at high altitude, we still need to get whatever little oxygen there is at that high altitude. We've got to somehow improve its ability to deliver to the, the tissues to make up for the fact that there's not enough oxygen. And one way we do this is we increase the production of DPG. Now, you guys might remember from glycolysis, uh, when you're studying metabolism, there's an intermediate called um, diphosphoglycerate, it can be either with a D like David or with a B like Bob. Um, this is a byproduct of glycolysis. And of course, glycolysis is the metabolic pathway that's used in red blood cells. They don't have any mitochondria, so there's no Krebs cycle electron transport chain. All right, so, okay, so they make more, so during, when you're in a hypoxic state, you generate more DPG. So how does that fit into this? Well, it turns out DPG binds to hemoglobin. And what happens is when DPG binds to hemoglobin at an increased amount, right? We'll look at this bottom scenario right here. If we increase the amount of DPG, that's going to decrease the amount of oxygen that's binding to hemoglobin, and it's going to facilitate delivery to the tissues. All right, so this is where, you know, this is where science kind of, you know, there's an no example of where there's, there's a couple possible scenarios, and we've seen this, both scenarios in animals, right? If you're at low oxygen, one way you can increase your available oxygen is to deliver it better. So by increasing the amount of DPG, we're releasing the oxygen from the hemoglobin and allowing the oxygen to get off the bus to the tissues. That makes sense. Another adaptation is where we decrease DPG, 
I'm not saying we, certain animals, less DPG allows more hemoglobin and oxygen to be bound. So this allows the hemoglobin to extract more oxygen from the air at the lungs, right? So some animals do this one, some do this one. Um, both are correct. I just wanted to illustrate possible ways that animals can do it. I think the more common one is one where you de they decrease the affinity, but both are possible um, in animal physiology. All right. Um, so this is basically showing with altitude, um, actually this isn't the altitude chart, but this is another one. If you increase DPG, you're gonna get a right shift to decrease the affinity. If you decrease DPG, you're gonna get a left shift, and that's going to increase the affinity. All right. In llamas, llamas are a good example where they, they tend to work on the side of increasing affinity, right? So they tend to see a decrease in the amount of DPG, which allows more hemoglobin to, be, to bind to oxygen at the lungs. Um, so we can go on and on about different high altitude animals, um, that how they act, but I just wanted to give you one example, and that's the llama that lives up in the Andes of Peru. All right, so we've spoken a lot about affinity. And in the, those of you that, that looked at the original um, lecture notes, um, this wasn't on it. I did, did send you an email that I updated this lecture a bit, and this is one of the slides that I updated. Um, we've spoken about the Bohr effect, which has to do with a change in affinity, a decrease in hemoglobin oxygen affinity, right, at metabolically active tissues to increase delivery, right? There's also what's called the root effect, and this is unique to fish. Um, this happens to be an eel, um, but also in many fish. Um, this is a situation in which, in response to a decrease in pH, well, let me back up for a second. We know that the Bohr effect, right, in response to a decrease in pH or increased acidity, right, there's kind of an uncoupling of hemoglobin and oxygen, decreased affinity, right? And fish have that, that that's, that's, they, they respond to the Bohr effect. That's part of their uh, physiological response. There's also the root effect. The root effect is where with that same decrease in pH, there's a decrease in the carrying capacity. So this is kind of interesting. So not only with the Bohr effect do you see a decrease in the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, which facilitates kind of the unbinding of it, but by decreasing the carrying capacity, that interferes with the ability of oxygen to bind in the first place. So less oxygen is able to bind with the root effect, and whatever oxygen is binding becomes uncoupled due to the Bohr effect, right? So... That, and that's really interesting. Even if you might have a lot of oxygen in the blood, it's not going to, the, the heme is not going to bind it as well under, under acidic conditions. So what's the advantage of this? Both the root and the bore effect greatly enhance oxygen delivery to active tissues. In the swimmers, remember when we were talking about fish and gills, respiration, remember I mentioned that They've got the gills, obviously, with the pressure changes in the um, buccal cavity and the opercular cavity. But then I mentioned in, in very active fish, they have to constantly swim, like tuna and eels and things like that. Um, they do what's called ram ventilation, where they open up their mouth and they just that water is just forced across their gills and they extract oxygen that way, right? These are very metabolically active. They've got a lot of red muscle and everything. Well, in order to get the oxygen, in order to enhance the delivery to the tissues, um, this is where the root effect is most effective, most beneficial. To give you an idea of the contributions of the root effect, and unfortunately, it's, it's looking across species. I probably should have put one with the same. Um, if you look at how the Bohr effect enhances oxygen delivery in us. It basically, in us, 
it will affect oxygen delivery. It will increase it by about 1.3% in humans. Most animals, it might increase it 5%, 10%, maybe even 20% metabolically active. However, with the root effect, the root effect can actually increase the delivery by about 73%. So it greatly enhances oxygen delivery to animals that really need it, right? Because tuna and eels need a lot more oxygen availability just due to their musculature than, say, you know, just a, a minnow or just other smaller fish, right? It's the big muscular fish that need it. To draw a species comparison um, with crocodilians, remember I mentioned that when they dive, right, the blood is diverted from the pulmonary circuit into that aorta? Well, not only that, but the hemoglobin, it, it actually we get improved oxygen delivery. And one of the reasons for that is when a crocodiles are submerged in water, we have fish always in water, but when the crocodiles are submerged, there's a buildup of CO2 and bicarbonate, which basically affects the affinity and will therefore increase delivery of tissue to the tissue. So with crocodilians, this is their adaptation to diving, kind of like a, a bore effect, kind of an enhanced bore effect. Um, whereas with fish, they've got the bore effect and the root effect. All right. I want to talk a little bit more about the Haldane effect. Um, remember I mentioned the Haldane effect is really associated really with the lungs as opposed to the Bohr effect, which is primarily at active tissues. So what's involved here? So first of all, the Haldane effect is the ability of hemoglobin to carry increased amount of carbon dioxide in deoxygenated tissues as opposed to the oxygenated lung state. Okay, so that's, what does that really mean? That means if you're at the lungs, right, oxygen is, um, hemoglobin binds to oxygen very efficiently. High affinity, right, of hemoglobin and oxygen, that's where the loading occurs. At that same place, CO2 can't bind as well, and that's why CO2 is released to the lungs. So oxygen-rich blood at the lungs Oxygen or oxygenated hemoglobin in the lungs cannot bind the carbon dioxide as well. That's the Haldane effect, right? And this is it right here, lower, lower affinity, lower CO2. In contrast, if we're looking at metabolically active tissues, right, it's right here. So it's kind of like the right shift, but in this case, it's looking at CO2. So the ability of hemoglobin to carry increased amounts of CO2 in the, in the active tissues as opposed to the oxygenated or lung state. A high concentration of CO2 facilitates dissociation of hemoglobin. Okay, so to kind of combine Bohr and Haldane, Bohr is at the metabolically active tissues where you've got a buildup of CO2, right, which helps to reduce the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, and oxygen is delivered. That's the Bohr effect. In contrast, at the lungs, hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen, which reduces the affinity for CO2, and CO2 is released out through the lungs. That's the Haldane effect. All right. Loaded lecture, but I hope, hopefully you guys are enjoying this. I, it's really interesting stuff, I think. But anyway. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the pathologies associated with hemoglobin. I'm not gonna get into all of them, um, but just, just a few in particular, and I think you guys are familiar with these. First one is a condition, and again, we're looking at humans, um, sickle cell anemia. This affects roughly eight to 11% of African Americans. It's a genetic condition, it's a recessive gene, that results in a single substitution um, of that, uh, where valine is substituted for glutamic acid on the beta chains. That should say beta, not B. So during, trans, during transcription, right, the, the, the message is altered. There's a mutation which results in a different amino acid, 
along that chain, which not only does it cause a different hemoglobin, which is known as hemoglobin S for sickle cell, but that single change is enough to change the characteristics of the hemoglobin and the red blood cell in general. Red blood cells become very fragile, rigid, um, sticky, and they tend to clump together. They become very sticky. And of course, there's the change in the shape. This is a normal red blood cell. And of course, red blood cells are basically sacs full of hemoglobin because they don't have any organelles. This is normal red blood cell. These are sickle cells. What this results in, and one of the major complications, is because these cells tend to stick to each other and clump, this tends to clog up the blood vessels. And by clogging up the blood vessels, right, this is going to um, if, um, impair oxygen delivery to the tissues. So you can get um, multi-organ system failure. Interestingly, and I'm not sure as far as how this was discovered, um, but um, nonetheless, it's quite remarkable, is that a drug known as hydroxyurea has been used to help treat the symptoms of sickle cell. And the way it does this, this reactivates what we call the fetal hemoglobin. Now, we haven't spoken about fetal hemoglobin, but I'm just going to touch on it a bit. Um, this is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve for normal, like, adult hemoglobin, right? This is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve in a fetus. And then you, you think of what's fetal, isn't fetal hemoglobin the same? It's the same. Well, no, it's not. It's a different form of hemoglobin that, first of all, doesn't bind to DPG. It normally has a much higher affinity for oxygen. Fetal hemoglobin has a much higher affinity for oxygen, as you can see this left shift. So how does that fit in? If you treat a patient with hydroxyurea, this leads to a particular signaling cascade. I'm not going to go through all the details, but ultimately results in the induction of fetal hemoglobin. It basically flips the switch so the body not instead of making normal adult hemoglobin, the switch is flipped, starts making fetal hemoglobin, and that can help reduce the symptoms. Um, I haven't explored um, percentage-wise studies done, how many people it's helped, um, long-term effects, how many treatments someone has to get, but um, someone wants to look that up, I think that'd be quite interesting. The other condition is called thalassemia. Um, and this, as far as a regional distribution, this primarily affects people of Asian, Mediterranean, as well as parts of Africa uh, originate from those areas. As you can see kind of in the orange. This is also genetic. Instead of causing a single mutation in the beta chain, this particular condition results in the failure to produce either an alpha or a beta chain. Failure to produce an alpha or a beta chain. Okay, so what does that mean? You can't make normal hemoglobin. And so this is going to result in very small red blood cells. You can't really tell from here. Um, anemia and kind of some of the same symptoms as you saw with sickle cell, impaired oxygen delivery. All right. Um, now, as far as treatments for this, I must admit I haven't looked into that. Um, I've had students in the past that have had family members that have had thalassemia, but um, that have you know, done well um, with certain treatments, but I'm, I'm not aware, if anyone's aware of any, I'd be really interested to find out. Maybe G, this is where gene therapy could come in handy. All right. Last topic I want to address is carbon dioxide transport. So we focused a lot on, on oxygen transport, right? And of course, hemoglobin transports about 98%, most of the oxygen in that's um, being transported is transported by way of hemoglobin. Okay, so let's take a look. 
how does, hem how does CO2 get transported? First of all, CO2 gets transported instead of in one form, it gets transported in three forms, okay? Um, let's take a look at first the one that's most similar to with oxygen. It does get transported bound to hemoglobin, but only about 20%. Um, about 10% is freely dissolved in plasma. The overwhelming majority is transported in the form of bicarbonate ion. And of course, how do you generate bicarbonate? You remember from that equation I showed you before, CO2 and water are converted into carbonic acid by the, there's an enzyme, which I haven't mentioned, called carbonic anhydrase, which forms that. And then carbonic acid being an acid dissociates into protons and bicarbonate. So this is where CO2 is, is bound to. So from a visual standpoint, I wanna focus on a couple of things that I think are quite interesting. Um, first of all, we're forming hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. All right, so we know hydrogen ions, right? More hydrogen ions, greater the acidity. You can imagine, you really don't want hydrogen ions building up in the blood. So how do we deal with all this? All right, so let's take a look at transport of oxygen. I'm just gonna look at the transport from the tissues into the blood. I'm not gonna look at from the blood to the lungs, just from the tissues into the blood. CO2 can diffuse into the blood, into the plasma. This is, remember, about 10%, right? About 20% of the CO2 binds to hemoglobin. 70% of the CO2, remember, is converted into carbonic acid, which dissociates into bicarbonate and hydrogen, right? This is nasty stuff, hydrogen. What happens is hemoglobin actually sops up the hydrogen ions to so there's no free hydrogen ions that otherwise the red blood cells would, would burst, right? I mean, or they, would, they, they, they wouldn't be functional. So basically the, the hemoglobin helps to kind of buffer the hydrogen ions. What about the bicarbonate? That's right, that's, that's, the form, that's this right here. Where does the bicarbonate go? The bicarbonate travels back into the plasma, but if you know from chemistry, right, when you're looking at ionic balance, right, if you're losing a negatively charged molecule going in one direction, that has to be countered by another negatively charged molecule, right? This is what's called the chloride shift. And the chloride shift involves the movement of bicarbonate ion, which is really the, kind of the, the transports form of CO2 here as a, as, a, as a buffer in exchange for chloride. We see this chloride shift in other parts of the body. We see it in the digestive system with hydrochloric acid, but just wanted to mention that as an important uh, feature is that it's a transport system that basically allows for the movement of bicarbonate in exchange for chloride. All right, so let's stop the share and we still have 11 people here, all right. All right, um, so does anyone have any questions? All right, well, I guess not. So um, I'm gonna go in as usual. I'm gonna, going to upload this, send the information to you guys. Tomorrow, um, we will review. So you've got the study guide on Blackboard. Go through that. We'll go through the, 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 the uh, information that's on that study guide. And I will also, well, actually, the, the window for the exam on Wednesday, thanks to you guys, is 1 to 5. So um, I will be mentioning that to everybody tomorrow. So that is it.